My name is Mario Batali, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Ray, Vito, and Greg, and we're talking about the Italian cooking and our love for it, such that that we're even talking something about a geographical position in Sicily, right here to my left. The area that we're talking about is a beautiful estate called Ganji Vecchia, which is about halfway between Taormina here and Palermo here, in the mountains here called the Madonie Mountains. And the specific place is just the most magnificent estate. And the three dishes that we're going to make today are called ricotta donuts, or panzerotti con la ricotta, a spaghetti with beautiful little monkfish cubes and garlic, and then we're going to finish it off with some barbecued lamb chops with some fire-roasted artichokes that are so simple to make and yet so delicious and so pleasing that we've got to get right into it. So the first thing we're going to make is the dough for the ricotta donuts, and it's simple. There's no yeast, there's no must, there's no baking powder, there's no fuss. It's simple as can be, and all it involves is salt, flour, and water. When you're making a dough like this just with flour and water, you want to make sure that your water is a little bit warmer than room temperature. It makes it a lot easier to work it through. Could you use eggs in that? If you used eggs, you would change the entire complexion of the dough, so you wouldn't. You would stick with this, and you wouldn't use milk, and you wouldn't try to add cheese to it. The main, the main ideology behind a lot of this simple country food that I try to use a lot of here on the show is that a lot of times it is really just about water and just salt and just flour or just cooking vegetables in boiling water as opposed to braising them or making them into some, tip, some fancy technique. Although, when you're cooking at home, once you become familiar with the vernacular and the ideology of the ingredients and the style, you're certainly welcome to start to try up and invent your own dishes, which really is what great Italian cooking is all about. It's not so much about the textbook style of way of doing things, it's about the personal interpretation of how things happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to knead this, and we would knead it for about 10 minutes because we really want to develop something called gluten. That is to say, there's high gluten flour, low gluten flour. Cakes and muffins are things that you don't want a lot of gluten in. Bread and crunchy things and little fritters, you do want gluten in because that's what allows it to kind of hold its shape and hold itself together when it's cooking. So we would knead that for a long time, 10 or 15 flour. minutes. All purpose is a good medium gluten flour. What you'll have at that point then is you'll tear this into three pieces. And you'll just take them like this and continuously roll it onto itself. And this is for any kind of a bread dough. And then you just put it down. You do that again and do it again. And pretty soon, you'll let it rest because you've kind of stretched that gluten out a little bit and it's a little more difficult to work with. And then what you want to do is make your filling. So we have these three here, which in about 15 minutes will kind of lose that little bumpy edge to it and become just like these three here. Now our filling is going to consist of ricotta. Beautiful, simple sheep's milk ricotta is what they used at this beautiful place called Ganji Vecchio, but you could use just any fresh ricotta. The fresher, the better. If you can find one that kind of pops out of its can a little bit, not necessarily blowing up, but there's this kind that we buy in New York that kind of looks like a chef's hat or a souffle. That's a really good one, but anything's really good. If it wasn't creamy enough, the way to fix a ricotta that looks a little bit firm is just add a little bit of milk or even just a little bit of water. I always like to add a little bit of extra virgin olive oil and a little seasoning, salt and parsley. What's the difference between ricotta and pachis? Is there a difference? No, they're both, you know what they are? They're both, they're, they're in the same family. Ricotta is actually the, the Italian name for pachis, and the way they make that is they make their initial cheese. They take the milk, they add uh, the divider, or the separator, the caglio as they call it in Italian, and they bring it up to a boil. The curds separate from the whey. You pull away the curds and you make it into an initial cheese, either by drying it or hanging it and forming it into different shapes or whatever. You take that secondary liquid, the whey that's left over, and you add something else to it, maybe more salt or maybe even lemon juice, and you bring it up to a boil again, and that second cheese is called pot cheese. It's also called ricotta because it's recooked. Ricotta is that exact thing. Now in this case, I want this to be just a little bit softer than that because when we're eating these beautiful panzerotti della ricotta, we want it when we bite into it to kind of ooze. You're looking for a mouthfeel when you're talking about good things in your mouth. You understand that the way that things react and the way that they behave when you finally get to eating them. It's really important to understand how that can really affect not only the taste but the memory of that dish. So you want this ricotta to be relatively soft. This one was a little firm. So I could have either added milk or water, but in this case I added olive oil. Now we'll take these balls of dough, and before we address them to our machine, we want to make sure that we give them a good amount of flour. Now if we were in Ganji Vecchio, they'd probably just roll it out with a wooden, wooden rolling pin or a wooden dowel on a wooden board, but we're going to try to make it a little bit easier by using one of these machines. So I'll pat the point down, and then I'll just load it in like that. And we'll do that once, through that, then dust it again with flour. 
and do it another time through that same number. In effect, we're actually kneading this just a little bit more as we run it through the machine. Do you always fold it twice? Always do it twice. And then we're going to do it one more time on the next number down, which in this case is number 11. It's just a little joke, fellas. It'll be number two. So you're not going to have it that thin, really? Oh, no, it doesn't have to be that thin. This isn't paper thin like pasta. This is actually a fritter dough. These are like donuts. And it's just the outside, the wall of the, the filling, most importantly. The real idea is that we have to understand that this is going to be three different kinds of little donuts or little fritelle or panzerotti, as we're going to call them. Brush all that flour off my hands. Now, we take the ricotta, and we're going to take it just like so, and we're going to put a little bit every couple of inches so that we have a variety of these. And again, now, the, the thing to realize when you're talking about Sicilian cooking is that they were not for, ev for a longest time really big fans of having antipasto as a seeded course. They tended to have like their little antipasto in kind of a festive seating, maybe out on the terrazza or down by the pool or whatever. So they would serve these as kind of pasta hors d'oeuvres and you'd have that with a little glass of rosé. And then the three different ways that we're going to flavor this is I'm going to take a little bit of mint for this group here and I'm just going to go do 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 then I'm going to take botarga the salted row of tuna and grate it on one how is that prepared what, that this is just they take like the big salted they, 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 they take the big egg sac which would be eventually caviar if you wanted and they just salt it like a prosciutto and then they dry it and then they serve it like that, and you grate it over things, and it works out absolutely deliciously. Now with these, I'm just gonna press them here like so, and form our little panzerotti. And then here is to make, the trick here is to make sure that it's firmly pressed down. So you just wanna go like this on all three of these. And then you just cut them out. And I'm gonna drop these in a deep fat fryer, that is to say extra virgin olive oil at about 300 degrees. When we come back, we'll pull them out, taste them, and then we'll get going on the next beautiful course of my lunch at Ganji Vecchio. So please, stay with us. Hey, welcome back. Well, we've got our little panzerotti, our little fritters here coming out of the fryer. And boy, I gotta tell you, they look good. If there's anything I'm gonna do right now is just drizzle a little bit of that pecorino over the top and just let it kind of melt there. One of them's actually whistling to me. Yeah, I hear it. <laughs> a little bit of chili flakes, touch of parsley, and there we are, fellas. Welcome to the first course at lunch at Ganji Vecchio, this beautiful estate in the Madonia Mountains. Now, the next course they serve me, go ahead and plate them up, help them out, fellas. The next course they served me was a beautiful pasta, and there I am in the mountains thinking, well, it's kind of unusual to be eating pasta with seafood in the mountains. But then you think, well, Sicily's only, the furthest you can be from the sea is about 100 miles in the entire area of Sicily. And they brought out this beautiful monkfish, which is a kind of a trash fish, both in America and in Italy, meaning that it's inexpensive, they don't really think too much of it. And that's probably due to the fact that if you took a look at one of these guys, his head for an animal, for a fish this big, would be literally bigger than a basketball and not really charming looking. It's got kind of a big mouth and some big teeth. Have you guys ever caught one of these? They're nasty, but boy, are they tasty to eat. Go ahead and well, actually hold off a second, fellas. I don't want to force you into biting and loosening your taste buds. The trick to this fish is quite simple. Get it fresh. If you couldn't find this, virtually any fish would do. What we're going to do is just cut it into chunks and separate those chunks from this little kind of skin and, and sinew bit by just taking a knife and running it right along the spine. There's really only one bone in here besides these little backbones. And you just go like so and slide it along and take it out. This is called the poor man's lobster because it has a relatively firm texture. What you want to do, if your fishmonger has forgotten to do that, is just take your little knife, run it along like that, and just go like so so that you can remove that kind of gelatinous membrane. Now the gelatinous membrane may sound frightening, but that's actually a good sign that your fish is going to be fresh, that there's still kind of this mucusy looking stuff on the outside of it. It sounds worrisome, but as all fishermen know, that's exactly where you want it to be. So I'm going to cut the monkfish into little cubes. And the beauty of this fish 
is that it's really hard to overcook it. Even if you continue to cook it and cook it for another couple of minutes and even cook it another seven or eight minutes after it's completely done, it doesn't become too firm, over firm, or dry out. It actually feels a little bit like nuggets of lobster. And that's really what we're looking for. Now, with that, we're going to add some hot peppers. And these are little red jalapenos that I love. Could you use the green ones also? You could use the green ones. You could use the dried chilies. At uh, Ganji Vecchio, they have what kind of remind me of uh, cayenne peppers. They're longer and thinner than this. Go ahead, you guys. I think they're ready now. And the trick is, if you don't like it that spicy, don't put in that much. But remember that when you cook chilies like this, first of all, it's going to give me a nice blast of chili facial right here. So you have to be careful about that. But when you cook them, they become a little bit more mild. They're not nearly as hot as they were when they were fresh and raw. So I'm going to saute those chilies. I'm going to add a little salt to them. I'm going to add the monkfish to them and season that again. So I've seasoned just about everything that's gone in there. Now I'm keeping my distance from this pan because right now with those chilies, they're giving up that capsaicin, that kind of gassy chili heat that if you get over this and breathe it in, you're going you're gonna to know it. Then I'm going to take two cloves of garlic, slice it relatively thin. This is a little bit thicker than I normally do because I don't want it to toast up too quickly. It's really going to be exposed to this heat for probably five minutes before I add any liquid. And I just want to make sure that it all gets toasted. The key to this dish is cooking the monkfish in here with the oil, the garlic, and the chilies before you add the tomato to it. I'm going to turn the heat back up because we want it to become coated with that oil. Now, while that's going on, for a second here, we're going to take a look at some artichokes. Now, this is kind of a foreshadowing thing. This is the way they do these artichokes. They build this giant fire and then allow the whole thing to burn down to coals. Then they take these artichokes like this. They trim them like so. <clears throat> they get rid of the top leaves like this. And then they're going to stuff them. We're going to stuff them with this beautiful pesto. So what I'm going to make this pesto of, strangely enough, nothing to do with basil. I'm going to take whole lemons and I'm going to put them in here with a dozen cloves of garlic and some extra virgin olive oil. And what I'm going to do is process this until it becomes a paste. And the way that you can assure that's going to happen, all right, it's 15 garlic cloves. That's an emerald quantity of garlic. We're going to add about three tablespoons of salt. And then we're going to add extra virgin olive oil. And what this is going to become is this kind of a rub that you could rub on anything. Vegetables as they come off the grill, vegetables before they go on the grill. Let's go ahead and get it started. Now, how do you tell if the, the artichokes are, uh, are fresh or not? Is it really the trick with an artichoke is, as with most vegetables, there should be a firmness to it. It should be a dark color. It should feel, it should feel heavy for its size so that you know that it's still filled with good juice. And then also, the cut stock end should look relatively firm and be nice and long. That's one of the main events. What they'll do is they'll eventually keep trimming it. The greengrocer knows this too and knows that the main way that you can discuss or dis disguise fruit from looking old is to keep trimming just a little tiny bit off of this end every day so it always looks like it just came off of the vine. It's not necessarily the way it's really going to be. So then what we're going to do is we're going to force these guys open a bit. Are you just like the this. Choke out of those? We're not taking the choke out because we're going to know where they are and we're going to eat them knowing that we're going to leave them alone. So you pull them open like so, like that. And then we're going to take some almonds. We're going to add that to that. And I'm going to add just a little bit of chili flakes and a little bit more extra virgin olive oil. So it's going to be a, basically a runny sauce, not well, a sauce. Well, it's not even a sauce. This is something that's actually going to cook with it. We're going to take this stuff, stir it around like that, and put it right in it. And then we're going to lay these guys right on top of the fire. In this case, you could just use a slow barbecue, and you'll put them on like so. You'll just trim it like that and just set it there. And then if you have your barbecue going, just let it go slowly. If you have a gas grill, that's going to work really well. Because you want to be able to cook it slowly like that for a couple of hours. Now I'm going to take a couple of these tomatoes. Ooh. Stir them through. Always make sure that when you go to the canned tomatoes... You're not breaking down the tomatoes? Yeah, they're going to break down. You watch. I'm going to show you. I'm just going to hit it with this. And then I'm going to add just a half cup of dry white wine. And that's really our sauce. I'm going to allow that to simmer until it tightens up a bit. I'm going to take some pasta. And in my minuscule 
Jimmy Dean Pure Pork Sausage hand finger holders. This is about one pound of pasta. That's about 450 grams. That's enough for four people for a nice sized course. Drop that in there. When we come back, I'll show you how we get the lamb chops going, how we bring the whole thing together in our lunch at Ganji Vecchio. So please stay with us. I'm going to create a little sauce here that we're going to use for our beautiful scotaditi or lamb chops, which is the next course here, by taking a little bit of an onion and just starting to sweat them down in a pan here. We'll get back to that guy in a second. Our pasta is now perfectly cooked, that is to say about 30 seconds short of where we really want it to be. And we're going to dump it right in there and now we're going to continue to cook it with the condiment, as is traditional throughout the rest of Italy. The way we're gonna finish this is chopped mint, no fancy chiffonade here, just nice and roughly chopped. Some fennel fronds that you get here, but you can also buy dried fennel fronds in Italy. It's a huge thing in Sicily that they really love. We're just gonna give that a rough chop. And then you throw that in there, and the combination of the chilies and the monkfish to kind of add that fire. And then the mint and the fennel to kind of cool it down. Makes for something really, really cool. Our artichokes are flaming up a little bit here. That's what we like. If you have a squirt gun, you do it like that, or you just go like this and just reach in and kind of put out the little fire as it goes. But the outside is supposed to be charred, so we're happy with that. Now I've got the monkfish spaghetti here. And you take it to the bowl, and you bring it to the fellas. And believe me, guys, this is not dumbed down for the American palate. This is cooked just like they would eat it in Sicily. So why don't you go ahead and serve that, sir? Right. Hand them over the plates, Oops. no problem. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is take our lamb chops, and you get a rack of lamb from your butcher. Cost a bit of dollars. It's not exactly the least expensive cut of meat, but I'm telling you, it's definitely worth it. It's one of the most great dishes while we're doing that, I'm gonna pour you a little bit of Sicilian wine. This is a proprietorial blend of two indigenous grapes, Ansonica and Catarato. Absolutely delicious and inexpensive, which is one of my favorite things about good Sicilian wine. Now we've got our citrus sauce going there. It's still only caramelized onions. At this point, we're gonna take a little bit of rosemary and chop it. Go ahead, guys, bon appetito. Take a little bit of rosemary, pull it off the stem like so, give it a chop, chop, chop. Add a little bit of salt to that to help it kind of break down, because this is gonna be effectively our dry rub on top of which, onto which we are gonna rub our lamb chops. So we're gonna make them into nice double lamb chops. You just cut them straight down like that. You would just use the loin lamb chops in this? No, you could use any lamb chops. And as a matter of fact, you could even use a butterfly leg of lamb cut into smaller pieces. That makes for an excellent dish. Just it takes a little bit more work. I'm going to take these. This is the easiest one, obviously. And the one that you would serve to the fanciest guests, obviously, because it represents the most difficult to find cuts. So I'm just going to rub them like that. We're going to give them a little drizzle of olive oil. Mario, this has something of a kick. Is this something that's kind of normal? In that is very much the kick that they would make in Sicily. It would have that much of a bite. And I remember it, and I thought, well, geez, that's, that's good for me. But what about the rest of the people that, that are staying? And this Ganji Vecchio is kind of an estate. It's a hotel that you can stay at. They, they all look like they were just getting a little hot under the <laughs> collar. But that's all right. You know, a little, I mean, there, there's a bunch of chilies in there, but it's not that bad. It's no, just, it's, no. it's aggressive. So now we take our lamb chops, we put them on, we want to cook them medium rare, which is about seven minutes aside, and then you watch them and you check them. You're looking for an internal temperature of about 125, 130. Now we have our onions going here. What we're going to do is we're going to take the zests of oranges, lemons, and limes, three each. Then I'm going to add two tablespoons of sugar, and we're going to kind of create a sweet and sour glaze by taking the juices of an orange, a lemon, and a lime, and allowing those to muddle together over the heat there so it starts to form a little caramelization. When we come back, I'll show you how we bring this whole dish together while we have a beautiful lunch, just like I did at Ganji Vecchio. So stay with us.
Hey, welcome back. Now, if you're at Genji Vecchio, they're pulling these right off of the fire, and you're thinking, well, how the heck am I going to eat that fire-roasted thistle? And then you realize that's just like peeling off the outer edges. It's just like eating an artichoke anywhere. It's going to work really well for me. So then they put them up like this, and they bring them in these giant platters, of piles of pieces of lamb, and it's looking really good, and you're thinking, oh, man, I hope, I hope it looks tastes half as good as it looks and then of course you taste it and it does and it's everything's right and that's what makes Italian food so good then they take this little citrus thing and drizzle it over because we're still true to the Sicilian way which is a little bit of sweet and sour then some other person comes by one of these Monzu guys the chefs from the kitchen and he's made a brush out of some herbs and this is marjoram or oregano and he's made a little oil with some chilies and a little bit of fresh mint and he just kind of anoints everything with it and you're like holy moly that can't be for us and then they put it down in front and you realize the dream has come true. We're having lunch at Ganji Vecchio. We're in Sicily and there's almost nothing better than that. Simple as that, a real easy meal. We started with those beautiful panzarotti. We have the spicy spaghetti with monkfish and hot chilies. And then you finish with this. There's really only one thing left to do after something like this and that's finish your lunch, take a little walk, and have a great nap in the Sicilian sun. I want to thank you guys for being here. You've made it a heck of a lot of fun. I want to thank you guys for being here and I look forward to seeing you either in Sicily or on the next Molto Mar. Ciao. Thank you.